Hey, Steve Mignani here with some really good junkyard news. If you're gonna be anywhere near Sherman, Texas on March 24th and 25th, know that there's gonna be an outdoor auction uh, put on by Duncan'sAuctions.com of over 200 solid Texas parts vehicles. It's gonna be Fords, GM, Mopar, lots of tractors and even forklifts. These things all have to go. It's an online auction, but also an on-site auction. If you happen to be in Sherman, Texas, you can go and bid in person or again online but all 200 vehicles have to go don't let them get crushed to learn more about this auction which happens on march 24th and 25th of 2023 uh, check it out on duncansauctions.com and keep in mind if you're seeing this after march 24th or 25th 2003 the auction's over with but before then make sure you check it out and save some of these cars don't let them go to the crusher Hey, Steve Mignani here doing the junkyard crawl at Bernardston Auto Wrecking in Bernardston, Massachusetts with a 1976 Chrysler Cordoba. Now, 1975 was the first year for the Cordoba. And believe it or not, Chrysler called it the small Chrysler. Gotta remember, this is based on the Dodge and Plymouth B-body midsize platform. In other words, Plymouth Fury, Dodge Charger, while the Cordoba was Chrysler's take on the personal luxury segment, which really exploded with the 1969 Pontiac Grand Prix and 70 Chevy Monte Carlo. In particular, by 73, the Chevy Monte Carlo was selling huge numbers, and in fact, something like 30, 36% of all midsize cars by 1975 were of the personal luxury variety. And Chrysler wanted a piece of that. Voila, they brought out the Cordoba. It was a huge success. Now check it out. In 1976, the year this one was built, a total of 167,618 were built. These outsold the full-size Chrysler's four to one. The Newports, the New Yorkers, all those big cars. This was the one people were buying in 1976. Now keep in mind, in 73, the, the Arab oil crisis, the oil embargo hit, and Detroit started running scared towards smaller cars. But after the spigots opened up again, Again, Detroit forgot the lessons pretty quickly and cars like the Cordoba were popular now again this is considered a small car crazy but true now here's the thing if you like the Cordoba these things 75 6 7 these if you look at them closely you'll see an awful lot of 73 Chevy Monte Carlo to that point here is a 1974 Chevy Monte Carlo dealer brochure now from the side we can see it's got the long hood short deck, close coupled coupe as it were. And, and for sure, Chrysler took a good long look at that when it came out with their Cordoba. But we can see right here the circular headlights, the uh, opera roof, and on the left-hand side, the humps over the wheel openings. Those are things that were very distinctive of the second gen Monte Carlo 73 through 78. Well, here's the thing, when you look at the Chrysler Cordoba, you see those very same things, those big proud circular headlights. And again, the small Chrysler. Can you imagine a Cordoba being called a small Chrysler? Well, compared to a Newport or a New Yorker, it was pretty small. But here is the whole rundown inside. And again, if you look at the humped fenders, the close coupled roof with the Landau, that is Monte Carlo right there by way of Chrysler. Now we can see the interior, the velour interior right here by design of personal automobile. And again, this is basically what happened when muscle cars faded out, baby boomers started buying what they thought were just comfortable personal cars. And we can see on the left hand side, midnight black, good looking car, standard wheel covers. And on the right, that gold, that's the optional rich Corinthian leather, which Ricardo Multobon used to pitch for Chrysler. Of course, Ricardo Multobon was the host of Fantasy Island, but also a pitch man. And Johnny Carson used to goof about the rich Corinthian leather, but that's it right there, optional. And again, Ricardo Multobon. Here's the dashboard assembly here. Again, this is nothing more than a Dodge Charger slash Plymouth Fury with a really fancy body shell. Same torsion bar front suspension, same leaf springs in the back, uh, one inch longer wheelbase than on a Monte Carlo, 117 inches. We can see on the left all the options and stuff, the chronometer, the two at 231 tilt wheel, opera windows, all that stuff. And on the right hand side, interesting to see, standard engine, this is 1976, right? This is the, the third year after the OPEC oil embargo when everybody was freaking out. Standard engine, 400 big block with a two barrel. Economy minded axle ratios, but on the right hand side, we can see the image, the 400 cubic inch, that's the base V8 disc brake standard equipment. And if we look here, 
400 two barrel, but engine options, look at this, 360 or 318. These were no cost options. In other words, Chrysler didn't charge you extra to give you the smaller engine if you wanted the fuel economy of the 318 or the 360 and not the big thirsty 400 seen right here. Now here's the thing, the 400 came in three flavors for 1976. The two barrel, a four barrel with dual exhaust and 240 horsepower, or this one right here. This is the ENCODE 210 horsepower with lean burn. That's a 400, it's a big block for sure, but here's what's happened here. The lean burn is long gone. Somebody replaced the, uh, the thermal quad plastic carburetor with a traditional Holley, took all the computers, all the lean burn junk out of here, and we can see up on the firewall that is a direct connection electronic ignition conversion kit to the aluminum housing distributor right here with a single vacuum pod. So somebody de-lean burned this with an Axel coil uh, to get away from that lean burn. But again, 210 horsepower with the lean burn. And the amazing thing about lean burn was that while catalytic converters were starting to come on strong, you won't see one on a 400 Mopar with lean burn. Here's the proof. Let's open that door. And on the edge, we see right here, Here's the VIN, but look at this non-catalyst. Yup, the lean burn was that clean. Catalytic converter wasn't needed. Of course, that would change, but with that said, it's amazing. A 400 four-barrel big block didn't need a cat when it had lean burn from the factory. And here we have SS22N. There's that N bur the lean burn 400, 210 horse, 1976 model year, et cetera. It's a built in Canada right there. Then here we have the, the R code, of course, Canadian assembly right there. Inside, let's have a peek here. And uh, we can see this one does not have the rich Corinthian leather, while uh, this one has the velour interior, but the uh, column shifted torque flight automatic, the 100 mile an hour speedometer, which was something seen in all, in, in all Cordobas, the uh, days of the Charger RT, 150 mile an hour speed speedometers were long gone. But again, this one does not have the buckets in the center console, which were possible on Cordoba, but most of them were done this way. Uh, and this one has the uh, cruise control right here. You can see right there, extra cost. There it is, the cruise control. Now you gotta remember too, that Dodge took a little page out of it. This is the Charger 1976, and this is the Charger Daytona right there. Same basic package as the Cordoba, same face, same everything. And that is Tom Selleck, who later became Magnum PI, but here he is pitching the Dodge Charger Daytona, and no wing, no spoiler. But again, these Daytonas are built for a few years, basically a graphics package. But here's the thing, from Magnum PI to Magnum GT. <laughs> you got to remember, this is the uh, Dodge Magnum right here. This arrived in 1978 and 79, only two years. But look at this ad in the background. That's a 70 AA Arcuda. Why was Dodge touting a 70 Plymouth Cuda AAR in a 78 Dodge Magnum ad? Wouldn't they have used a Challenger TA if they were being honest? Well, here's the thing. The owner of the car standing through the T-top is Bruce Letsky, who was a golf pro in 1978. So basically, he became a spokesperson. So from Magnum PI to Magnum GT, if you pay attention, you'll see all kinds of weird stuff. Speaking of paying attention, let's play a little game of what's in the box. Let's have a look here. You never know what you're going to find in these things. Let's see here. Jay Dahmer. Huh, I wonder who that was. Anyway, inside, ah, okay, like a little bag here with uh, newspaper clippings, probably uh, missing persons reports, carbon choke cleaner, all about it to uh, snuff his victims. I'm joking. Uh, and then let's see, we have some t shirts, it's probably some DNA on that, but nothing too cool inside of this. But you never know what you're going to find inside of cars in the junkyard. Here are the original wheel covers from this one. These are Chrysler's simulated spoke wheels, and these were used, I think, 74 up on everything from Plymouth Grand Furies to Chrysler Cordobas, the fake knockoff, fake spokes. The trouble with these things, you hit a granite curb with these things, you smear the spokes. We can see it's been done here, easily damaged. But with that said, a pretty convincing fake wire wheel on this one right here. But again, we come around... To the back of this, we see right here these humps right here, which were shared later on the Dodge Magnum, but were initially inspired by the 73 Monte Carlo. 
and this roof here with a little opera window, a little Landau light, these things strictly Chevy Monte Carlo. Now the sales on these, again, were 167,618 in 1976, and about the same number in 75 and 77. These cars were major profit centers for Chrysler Corporation, but here's the thing. By 1978, Chrysler was facing bankruptcy, so these things were good, but not that good. Of course, the uh, Dodge Omni and Plymouth Horizon mini cars arrived in 78, but the problem was the profit on a car like this was probably 900 bucks. The profit on a Horizon was probably 90 bucks, so even though they sold a bunch of those little tiny front-wheel drive cars, these big ones here made the backbone of profits for Chrysler Corporation. So by 1979, Chrysler was on bankruptcy. Lee Iacocca had to come and get that billion-dollar loan. They paid it back, but only with front-wheel drive K cars. So this is kind of the last of the line right here for full-sized, big-block, four-barrel uh, Chrysler mid-sized cars. And believe it or not, this is considered the small Chrysler in 1975. And again, the Cordoba was popular for several years. So I, I like to say, if you like a Cordoba, you better like a Chevy Monte Carlo, because that's really where the idea came from. There's nothing wrong with copying success, and that's exactly what Chrysler did with the Cordova. Now, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe to the Steam Mag's YouTube channel, hit the like button, share this video, and by all means, hit the bell so you're aware when the next video comes out, which is tomorrow morning.